From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ben Tyler, Johnny. Transworld Fidelity. Oh, hi, Ben. Are you free at present? If the price is right. I mean, are you on a job? It's beginning to sound like it. Can you be on a plane for Algiers in two hours? Sure. Who's the client? Uh, Lorco Limited, Amsterdam. You know, they're the... Diamond Cutters, an old firm. Big-time deals all over the world. Check. What happened? Oh, one of their couriers just dropped dead in the Algiers airport. Oh, too bad. He was carrying a briefcase with $100,000 worth of set stones. Top-grade diamonds. Don't tell me, Ben. Let me guess. That's right, Johnny. The briefcase is missing. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Transworld Fidelity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Lorco Diamonds matter. Item one, $324.60, transportation. A routine plane flight to North Africa and the city of Algiers. It was an easy trip and I felt relaxed and comfortable feeling that was rudely terminated about 10 seconds after I got off the plane. You are Monsieur Dollar, are you not? Yeah, that's right. I am Inspector Marcus of the Algerian Customs Police. Oh, how are you, Inspector? Oh, quite well, Monsieur, and vastly reassured now that you have arrived on the scene of the crime. Oh? You see, I have implicit faith in special investigators. I have encountered them in the past, so I have no doubt, but this little affair will prove most simple to you, Monsieur. I see. I feel that in a mere matter of hours, voila, you will produce the guilty culprit like un lapin out of a chapeau. Inspector, I'm beginning to feel a cold wind from the north. That's odd for this time of year, isn't it? A mere passing breeze, monsieur. I shall now assume my official attitude. And that is? Extreme courtesy, complete cooperation, and the devoted service of my meager talents. On orders, you understand, from my superiors in Paris. And now, monsieur, if you will accompany me to my office. Delighted to. After you, Alphonse. My name is Pierre. Oh, sorry. Just a whimsy. Oh, yes, yes, I know. I have heard the joke. Both jokes. Uh-huh. Uh, this way, monsieur. A man from the local diamond firm is waiting for us. A special representative, so he informs me. And so, since you yourself are a special investigator, I could perceive a certain advantage in letting him give you the facts, as I believe you say it in the States. Tie our tails together, sit back, and watch the fur fly, is that it? Uh, well, he is a trifle excitable, but your metaphor, however, escapes me. Oh, I doubt that, Inspector Marcus. In fact, I doubt if much of anything escapes you. You are too kind. Except, of course, $100,000 worth I of diamonds. I spoke too hastily. Vanished, disappeared, right under your nose. Oh, uh, well, but there the were extenuating circumstances. Oh, I'll bet there were. Uh, tell me something confidentially. Did your superiors in Paris really blow their tops? Monsieur Dolan, if I may borrow one of your more colorful expressions, they said I had probably goofed. <laughs> I'd met that same attitude before with local officials. To them, sending in an outsider implied they couldn't do the job themselves. And Inspector Marcus was on an even hotter spot. The air terminal was a port of entry to Algeria, under his jurisdiction, Customs Police. As he said, he'd goofed. Maybe. It is a matter which hath entire pass all apprehension. But he was right on one thing. Hans Zeindorf, the Lorco representative, was a trifle excitable. In Amsterdam, it is unthinkable such thing have happened like this. Even in your New York, mein Herr Dollar, it cannot have happened. But here, in Algiers... It have happened. Yeah, yeah, this beautiful diamond gone. All gone. Ah, It's like barbarians. This Africa is no place for diamonds. Maybe you ought to tell them that in Kimberley. It's differently there. It's entire different. All right, Mr. Zeindorf. Suppose you tell me just what happened. Who can know, my dear... Fifteen years, this courier has worked for Lorco Company. We are thinking he is trustworthy. Entire trustworthy. Well, even a trustworthy man could die a heart failure. Ah, but he has never had these heart failing before. All right, but... 
Perhaps it would be better if I were to, with your permission, of course, Monsieur Seindorf. Yeah, 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 you tell. I am not talk this English much good. Uh, precisely, precisely. Uh, these are the facts, Monsieur Dollar. The local courier, a man named Paul Gruber, arrived on the plane from Amsterdam yesterday morning. Yeah, yeah. Did you know he was arriving? I did not know, but the point is a very clever one. So, a short while before landing, Monsieur Gruber was taken suddenly ill. A doctor met the plane, and the stricken man was removed by stretcher and taken to the emergency clinic. In 20 minutes, monsieur, he was dead. Diagnosis, heart failure. Mais c'est la vie. Was there an autopsy, Inspector? Ah, another excellent point, monsieur Deller. Thank you. Yeah, do not mention it. An autopsy is being performed this afternoon. Good. So the courier died. And then the briefcase? It was delivered along with his other personal effects, unopened to the customs property agent here at the airport. And his name, the property agent? André Jourdain. He was very busy at the moment, left the briefcase lying on his desk, intending at the first opportunity to register and place it in the vault. But the opportunity didn't come, is that it? Ah, precisely, precisely. Only a few minutes later, I heard a gunshot. Monsieur, he was lying on the floor in a pool of blood. He had been struck on the head. The briefcase was gone. All gone. This beautiful diamond gone entire. Yeah. When did you find out what was in the briefcase, Inspector? Uh, almost two hours later. I radioed the local firm in Amsterdam, informing them of the death of their employee. They replied immediately and stated that the briefcase contained $100,000 worth of diamond set pieces. Works of art, beautiful. One brooch, one uh, necklace, uh, two bracelets. Uh, precisely, precisely. Ah, yes, yes, yes. The jury was being flown here on approval for examination by a prospective buyer. Name of the buyer? The Countess Maria de Tolia. What do you know about her? Ah, uh, Monsieur Dallor. If you had seen her, you would not ask. She is exquisite, lovely, chic, charming, spirited, full of the joie de vie. And no doubt loaded with potatoes. Eh, with a woman like that, who would ever inquire? I would. Since it looks as though she might be the only person in Algiers who knew that a hundred grand worth of jewelry was coming in on that plane. Uh, may we, may we. But she could not have known that the courier was going to drop dead in the airport. Uh, a good point, Inspector. Uh, merci, monsieur. What about that property agent, André Jourdain? Any chance of talking to him? Oh, but of course, if he is yet able to talk... Then I guess I'll... Talking is not enough, my dear. Relax, Herr. Mr. Zeindorf. You're covered by insurance. Insurance is money. It's not my diamonds. Oh, well, if you don't want the money, you can always waive your claim. Waive my... Wait. My dear dollar. Are you think that I am crazily? That I am entire crazily? I talked to the plane crew who'd come in on the flight with a dying courier. I talked to Inspector Marcus's men, who had been with him when he found the property agent lying on the floor of his office. I didn't expect much, and I got just that. But it didn't matter. I figured I may have had my man spotted already. The same old story. An ambitious and underpaid government agent opening a briefcase to register its contents and seeing the diamonds there for the taking. Hiding them quickly, then a fake slugging and firing a gun at a non-existent thief. Yeah, an old, old story. Expense account item two, $3.40. Transportation into town and taxi fare to the Hospital of Our Lady of Sorrows. Inspector Marcus had phoned ahead to authorize my visit. One of the sisters led me down the corridor to the door of Andre Jardine's room. She motioned silently and then turned away. I stepped inside and closed the door. Monsieur? You're Andre Jardine? Uh, me, oui. But yes. What do you want? My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. My company is the underwriter on the Lorco Diamonds. Why have you come here? Well, to ask a couple of questions. Of course, if you'd like to consult an attorney before... I have nothing to conceal, monsieur. What do you wish to know? Just exactly what happened when that briefcase disappeared. I have told it already to Inspector Marcus. Yes, I know. So now would you mind telling it to me? But there is no... Bien. I was working at the files when someone entered my office. I turned around and saw a man standing there, pointing a gun at me. Ever seen it before? No, monsieur. What did he look like? Well, he was quite tall. Heavy set? No, very thin, tall and thin. European, I believe. All right. What did he do? He ordered me to turn around, stepped up behind me, struck me with the gun. 
I fell against my desk. He grabbed the briefcase and ran to the door. You were still conscious? Oui, monsieur, but in terrible pain. I fumbled for my gun in the drawer of the desk and fired one shot. It is all I can remember. Uh Uh-huh. You hadn't by any chance opened that briefcase? I had been too busy. And you didn't know what was in it? Not until they told me today. Andre, I wonder if you'd mind if I lifted a corner of that bandage and took a look at that wound on your head. If you are careful, it is very painful. Oh, sure, I'll be careful. Uh, Lie still now, please. It'll just take a second. I'll lift this edge and... I think I am lucky to be alive. Mm. Yeah, very lucky. Okay, thanks. It is nothing. Andre, do you happen to know the Countess d'Atalia? The Countess? Oh, monsieur, she is unquestionably... Yeah, I know. She's lovely, exquisite, charming, chic... Well, thanks for your cooperation, Andre. A pleasure, Monsieur Dollar. Take care of that head. It's the only one you've got. (laughs) You Americans are so whimsical. Oh, yeah, we're all crazily, entire crazily. My pet theory was starting to limp. That slugging wasn't phony. It had taken 14 stitches to close the cut in Andre's head. Whoever hit him hadn't been kidding. They meant it for keeps. I walked down the corridor and stood waiting for the elevator, thinking it over, trying to figure it out. But no go. I needed more facts. And a moment later, I got more facts. Monsieur Duller, I thought I would find you here. Uh, A clever piece of deduction, Inspector. Merci bien, monsieur. Don't mention it. What's on your mind? There should be something. Well, there's got to be some reason for that smug grin. What happened? Did the thief confess? Uh, Au contraire. I was on the point of asking what progress you were making on the case. You will be happy to hear none at all. Oh, that is too bad. Uh Uh-uh, Inspector. Eh? Extreme courtesy, complete cooperation, the devoted services of your meager talents. Remember? Touché, touché. Actually, I came to tell you that I now had the report of the autopsy. The courier who died of heart failure. Ah. Only he did not die of heart failure, monsieur. Except, of course, in a very literal sense. Well, what did he die of? Poison. Well, that was the end of a good theory. The courier had started to get sick on the plane, so the robbery and the murder had been planned well in advance of his arrival. By somebody who'd known, he was bringing in diamonds. And so far, only one person fit the bill. As lovely, charming, and chic a suspect as you could ever hope to meet. The Countess Dettolia. Johnny Deller. This is the Countess Dettolia. Oh, yes. My mate tells me that you were trying to reach me by telephone. That's right, Countess. I want to talk to you. Where are you now? Well, at my residence, of course. Did you think I might come running immediately to your hotel, Mr. Dollar? Not after hearing your description. I'm seldom that lucky. What is it exactly that you wish to talk about? A hundred thousand dollars worth of diamonds and a dead man. I'm a special investigator I for know the... who you are. I investigate before I call you. Well, not only beautiful, but clever. This ought to be interesting. I'm afraid I don't entirely understand your uh, flippancy. Then suppose I come over and explain it to you. Say around 8 o'clock? I'll make a definite effort to be here. You know something, Countess? I think it's about time somebody built a small fire right under that lovely little complacency of yours. I'll be there at 8 with matches. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Algiers, North Africa, to the Home Office Transworld Fidelity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lorco Diamonds Matter. Expense account continued. Item four, six dollars and eighty cents, dinner and appetizers. I'm never any good trying to spar with a lovely female suspect on an empty stomach. I was finishing up on black Algerian coffee and white Algerian brandy when a slightly green-eyed Algerian police inspector sauntered up to my table. You, Monsieur Dana, you special investigators really do live well. In the lap of luxury. Pull up a chair, Inspector. Join me in a sarsaparilla? 
It is on your expense account. Pay my guess. Uh, merci, monsieur. Ah, bon, bon, my favorite brand. Help yourself. Merci. Anything new? Mm, nothing at all. A complete impasse. Allez, votre santé. Mm -hmm. What about the man who sat next to that courier on the plane? Find out anything about him? No, I'm still working on it. Which is to say, of course, my men are working on it. Ah, uh, you police inspectors really do live well. I have to do my own legwork. Ah, but the glory, Monsieur Dollar, to come into a mysterious affair which has all the local police baffled, and to solve it immediately in one brilliant feat of deduction, to leave everyone gasping with admiration, to make one's exit to the sound of great applause. Not so fast, Inspector. I'm still back there with that brilliant feat of deduction. You have not yet found the solution? Uh, just on the verge. Ah. Then I will drink to your success. Uh, with your brandy, of course, and with your permission. Go ahead, drink up a storm. But I'm afraid I'll have to leave you pretty soon, but you can still go No, ahead. no, 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 monsieur. I suggest you change your plans. You will learn nothing which has any bearing on this matter. Which plan do you mean? That of questioning the Countess de Hortelier. Uh, who found that out? As a matter of fact, she phoned me and inquired about you. Ah, uh, so that's how she investigated me. Went straight to headquarters. Ah, mais oui, mais oui. Ah, remarkable woman. Talented, beautiful. Et cetera, et cetera, and so on. And along with it, it's nine to one. She's in it right up to her pretty neck. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. She is really not the type. Mm, this is an excellent brandy, monsieur. Uh, an Algerian brand. All right, Inspector, let's bypass the byplay and lay them out face up. I think I prefer it to cognac. I don't know how she does it, but she's got you hypnotized. Just mention of her name and you go into a tailspin, every cockeyed one of you. Exquisite. Love Maybe me. so, what? but in my book, she's a real suspect. Uh, elucidate, monsieur. Well, it's simple enough. She's the only person in Algiers, that we're sure of at least, who knew that a shipment of diamonds was coming in on that plane. Why? Because she's the one who ordered them. Uh, monsieur, it is even simpler. She could not have poisoned the courier because she was not on that plane. She could not have stolen the briefcase from the customs property agent because it was done by a man. So, psst, where is your case? An accomplice, a man, with the countess calling the shots for him. What man, monsieur? Well, you got a good point there. <laughs> Merci bien, monsieur. Don't mention it. But from the influence she seems to have, it might be any man in Algiers. Inspector, it wasn't you by any chance. Hmm. You raise a very interesting point. Now, suppose the Countess should ask me to kill someone for her. I wonder what I would do. A page boy came into the dining room looking for me. I followed him out and took the phone call in the hotel lobby. It was the American consulate with some information I'd asked for them earlier. I hung up finally and looked at my watch. I was already late for my appointment with the Countess. So I walked out the door of the hotel and flagged a taxi to the apartment of the Countess de Tolia. She lived in the swank Gentil Bois de Loué, a residential district favored by top government officials and wealthy French businessmen. But the building she lived in was a little frayed around the edges, and the maid she'd mentioned was nowhere in sight. The pieces were starting to fit together. Good evening, Mr. Dollar. Countess? Since you are here, won't you come in? Thanks. This way, please. I'm rather surprised that you came. I was really not expecting you. Yes, I know. Did uh, Inspector Marcus find you? Uh, look, suppose we get it straight right now. You seem to have a lot of influence with the inspector and probably with his superiors, too, from what I hear. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. Well, do we play cat and mouse for a while, or do you want to give up right now, hand them over, and, as they say, throw yourself on the mercy of the court? I would like a cigarette. You could always claim that you fell in with evil companions or that a man led you astray. They're in the box there by your elbow. A tall, thin man, for instance, with his collar turned up and his hat pulled down, carrying a gun when last seen after slugging a customs agent at the Algiers airport. Mr. Dollar, are you opposed to smoking on moral ground? No, but I'm opposed to murder. Have a cigarette? Thank you. Light? Is there any other way of smoking, then? <laughs> Mr. Dollar, I expected you to come here and be annoying, but I didn't know you were going to be insulting as well. That's just my mean personality. You seem to be under the ridiculous impression that I actually had something to do with this crime. I think you had plenty to do with it. A sort of uh, arch criminal, perhaps? Or what is it you call them in the States? Uh, big shot? Oh, Countess, you're a scream. 
I'll bet that courier died laughing. If you have a reason for these opinions, or believe you have a reason, I think you'd better tell me about it. Otherwise, good night. Oh, I, I have more than one reason. In the first place, I'm not certain that anyone besides you even knew the diamonds were being sent here. Except for the Lorco Company, of course, and they wouldn't be likely to advertise it. Mr. Dollar, all of my friends and most of my acquaintances have known for three weeks that I'd ordered that jewelry. Oh, uh -huh. Well, I have a copy here of a letter that was sent to you by registered airmail from the Lorco Company in Amsterdam a week ago today. According to post office records, you received it two days later. Remember it? Yes, I remember. It states the name, flight number, and time of arrival of that courier who was murdered. I said I remember And it, it cautions you specifically not to give that information to anybody. So even if other people did know, you're the only one who knew the exact time the diamonds were coming in and exactly who was bringing them. All right. Perhaps I am at fault, in a way. There was a cocktail party at the government club the same evening I got the letter. I forgot for a moment and told someone about it. Who? Just a girl I happened to be talking What's to. What's her name? It doesn't matter. She was just stopping over on a world cruise. Anybody else here? I don't know. The place was packed. Government men, business people, army, navy officers. Anyone might have heard. Uh-huh. Was Inspector Marcus at the party by any chance? Yes, I spoke with him during the evening. Mr. Dollar, I'll admit I was wrong, but there is hardly grounds for... All right, let's get to point three. The Countess Maria D'Atalia, Italian by birth, title inherited, old family, goes back through one line, in fact, to Lucretia Borgia. I did not poison the courier. Your family estates were confiscated by Mussolini. Family migrated to Bizerti, and then to Lisbon for three years. You left them there and went on to London. Since the war, you've lived in Paris, on the Riviera, back to London, Mallorca, and finally here. Have you been following me, Mr. Dollar? The consular was pretty thorough. Anyway, you're well known in the international set, accepted everywhere, and apparently able to get along fine on your title and your looks. It's not very pleasant to be dissected while one is still alive. As a matter of fact, your flat broke. You've been living on credit for the last four months. I think you have gone about far enough. And yet three weeks ago, you ordered $100,000 worth of jewelry sent to you on approval. How did you plan to pay for it? Get out. Or did you know you wouldn't have to pay for it because it was never going to be delivered? Get out of here. I don't have to listen to this. I don't have to answer your insulting questions. My private affairs are my own concern. So the ice finally melted, and now you're going to blow your top. Get out, or so help me, I'll kill you. You mean me, too? You... Oh, oh no, hey, put that down. Don't throw that. Why, you little devil. Stay back. Let go of me. Settle down, then, and stop throwing things. I will do as I please. It is a my house. So far as... <laughs> Oh. Good Lord. A woman who can even cry beautifully. Oh, leave me alone. Oh, you're unbelievable, baby. The boys were right. You're everything they said you were. Oh, it's too bad. Go away. All right. But before I do... What are you going... No, don't, don't... Why did you kiss me? It beats me. Just call it a sudden impulse. Then you have changed your mind. You don't really think I'm guilty. Oh, honey, I still think you're in this up to your ears. And I'll still bring you to trial if I can. And I still want to kiss you. You figure it out. Why figure, Johnny? I liked it, too. Oh, you ought to be locked up. If for no other reason, just to protect the guys who... What is it, Johnny? What are you going... That cigarette in the ashtray. Put it out fast. Get the windows open, all of them. Where's your kitchen? Back through the hall. Johnny, what are you going to do? Stay alive if I can. It was gas fumes, one of the bottled gases they use for cooking in the higher-priced apartment districts. The concentration had been building up and finally seeped into the drawing room. If we'd lit another match, we'd have been blown to bits. The kitchen was dark, but I didn't dare snap a light switch. One spark would do it. So I held my breath and followed the sound and finally found the range. Every burner valve was wide open. I could vaguely make out a glass chain door opening onto a terrace. I grabbed a breath of air, 
and moved toward another door that looked as though it might open into a hall. It didn't. It opened into a closet, and on the closet floor there was a body. What happened, Johnny? Why did you go... Johnny, who's that? He's a man from the Lorco Company. Name is Zindorf. Zindorf? But where did you find Out him? Out there on the floor of a closet. But why? What was he doing here? You tell me. I don't understand it. He has no business here. What is wrong with him, Johnny? Well, right at the moment, he seems to be a little bit dead. Johnny Dollar. Hello? Who is it? Hello? Hello? Johnny, who is it? I don't know, Countess. Maybe they weren't expecting a man to answer. Or at least not me. I would not know about that. What about this guy who was lying unconscious in your closet? Would you know anything about that? No, Johnny. I didn't think you would. I'll give him another shot of those smelling salts. I think he's coming too. Good. Maybe he'll know about some of these things. Yes, he will. Some of them. And of course he will tell you. I was hoping it would not be brought out. I did not want you to know. Murder is usually brought out sooner or later. Not murder, Johnny. It is not that simple. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Algiers, North Africa, to the Home Office Transworld Fidelity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lorco Diamonds Matter. Expense account continued. Item six, $9.30, smelling salts and a bottle of scotch. The smelling salts were needed for a double-talking fellow named Zeindorf, who'd managed to get himself gassed half to death in a closet. A representative of your client who suffered the $100,000 loss, Lorco Diamonds of Amsterdam. The scotch was for me. Johnny, he doesn't like it. Should I go on holding them under his nose? Yeah, sure. Keep shoving them at him until he's strong enough to fight you off. That's how smelling salts work. A person has to come to and sheer self-defense. Nein. Nein, stop. It's more too plenty already. My nose is killed dead no more. Maybe even poking it into the wrong places. What were you doing in that closet, Mr. Zeindorf? It's nothing. I can tell you the entire thing in two words. Use more if you need them, but make it good. Nobody has find this beautiful diamond. Nobody has do anything. So I come looking for my own self. In that closet? Nine is only for hiding. I am wait for everybody going away, going at sleep. Then I am going to looking. In my apartment. What made you think they would be here? You are pleased to forgiving me, Fräulein. But I am not taking the chance. I'm thinking to looking every place. Who turned on the gas out there? Do not ask it. I, I know nothing. I... I think I have sleeping some, maybe, and when I have waking, I am died almost. Yeah. Well, apparently somebody was out to get one of us, at least. Hey, what about that maid of yours, Maria? Or is the one? Of course. She... You know, that is strange. She disappeared about the time you arrived, slipped out without a word. Does she live here? I think she lives up in the Casbah. I hire her through the agency. I see. Do you think she did it? Oh, the more I find out, the less I'm sure of. Maybe Mr. Zeindorf did it, trying to commit suicide over his missing trinkets. Nine. Suicide is, is one thing I am not. And I, I desist to listen no more. I am to leave here immediate. Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Zeindorf. Yeah, what is it? As I understand it, you boys in the international jewelry business are ordinarily pretty cautious in your dealings. Yeah, yeah, the prudence, my dear. Always the entire prudence. That's what I mean. You always investigate a new client thoroughly before you take any chances, is that right? It's entire correct. Johnny, no. Then why did you send $100,000 worth of diamonds here to Algiers at the request of a woman who doesn't have a cent to her name? Ach, why it is to me these things are always happen. My dear dollar, I am the highest ethic of business. I cannot give you answering. Well, one of you better give me an answering. Oh, it is all right, Mr. Seindorf. Please... Please, you tell Contessa. All right. What he is trying to say, Johnny, is this. It did not matter about my financial standing because I was not actually a client. 
What do you mean? You ordered the stuff. Yes, several pieces and approval so I could make a selection. Anything up to $20,000. Somebody else was paying for it. It was being given to me as a gift. By whom? A fellow countryman of yours, a man named Charles Barrett. He's been here three months, lives on his yacht. Mr. Seindorf, how did you know this man Barrett would pay for the diamonds? By the letter, my dear. What letter? When I wrote to the local firm, I took the liberty of enclosing a letter written to me by Mr. Barrett. His own authentical signings we investigate immediately. What sort of a letter was it? He promised to pay for a gift of jewelry up to $20,000 of my own selection in return for certain considerations. What considerations? Romantic, mine hair. It is a little present of the engagement. Is that what it was, Maria? An engagement present? Yes. I see. I, I think I go now. It's too much has happened in this place. Is it all right to smoke now? Yes, yeah, sure. The gas is cleared out. Here. I wish you hadn't kissed me, Johnny. I thought you said you liked it. I did. That is why I wish you hadn't. Are you trying to say that... Oh, relax, Johnny. I am not a child. No, I have not fallen in love with you any more than you have with me. But I could. Very easily. What about this man Barrett? What's he like? Oh, an overbearing, spoiled, middle-aged little boy. The price sounds kind of high. What else is there? Ever think of working? Where? At what? In Italy, yes. But you know what's open there for an impoverished countess. Yeah, I know. And I suppose you can't get a work permit anywhere else, is that it? Oh, forget it, Johnny. All I know how to do is be highly ornamental, say the right things to the right people, do the right things at the right time, and eat by stealing caviar at cocktail parties. You go hungry a lot that way. Yeah, I guess it's rough. Well, don't let it throw you, honey. You're not the first girl who married for money. Well, I guess you don't understand. Nobody has said anything about marriage. Oh, I see. Well, Johnny, I imagine you will be leaving now. So, good night, Johnny. Goodbye. For all the progress I'd made in the case, I might as well have stayed at home. Another fish off the hook. Logical suspect number one had been the customs property agent, Andre Jardin. But the blow on the head that sent him to the hospital hadn't been faked. And that, plus the fact the diamond courier had shown symptoms of poisoning before the plane even landed, seemed to leave Andre in the clear. And now number two, Maria Catastatalia, was apparently able to supply another answer every time she needed one. And her answers were backed up by Hans Seindorf, Lorco's own representative. We were shortcutting through the harbor district when I began to realize that the same car had been behind us ever since we'd left Maria's. It was a low-slung English job, expensive and easy to recognize. Driver. Oui, monsieur? Hit the gas a little harder. See if you can shake that car behind us. Ah, uh, mais oui. The other car picked up speed to match ours and still held the same distance. Hey, try a couple of fast corners. I want to make sure. Yeah? The next place where the street narrows down. Stop fast. Swing crosswise. Block off the road. I want to stop that guy and have a talk with him. Hey, you understand what I mean? Mais oui, monsieur. It's just like in the movies. Yeah, well, something like that. And yeah, there's a place coming up. Let's, let's have a go at it. You do not worry. I will do it good. Yeah, I only hope we've seen the same movies. I was out of the cab fast and running back down the street. The other driver had jammed on his brakes and finally skidded to a stop against the curb. I reached for the handle, jerked the door open, and the man inside came out swinging. A big man, little on the beefy side, but plenty tough. I didn't know him, never seen him before. He fought silently and fought hard, but he was a sucker for a lift. I knelt down on the pavement and started to go through his pockets. I hadn't even noticed the other car pull up. 
Nom de chien, Monsieur Dallin. Huh? Do you merely plan to rob him, or do you also intend to cook him and eat him? Oh, you really get around, Inspector. The policeman must socialize, Monsieur. It broadens the outlook. Come, we walk. My chauffeur will take care of reviving your victim. Do you happen to know the victim? Yeah, may we? He's Monsieur Charles K. Barrett of Chicago. Maria's ex-boyfriend. Mm, something of this sort, I believe. How did you happen to get here so conveniently? Oh, I was following you. Uh, Father back, of course. Then why didn't you pitch in when the fight started? And spoil such a remarkable display of fisticuffs? Okay, okay. It is true the footwork was mediocre, but the verb, the enthusiasm, the violence, superb, monsieur. I can't quite figure you, Inspector. Well, sometime we must talk about it. Uh, monsieur... You will be most happy to know that we have identified the person who occupied the plane seat next to the diamond courier. Oh? They shared a bottle of wine during the flight. Undoubtedly, that is how the poison was administered. And who is the person? A man named Bobo. Bobo? Oui. He is well known in the Kasbah. He is a thief, smuggler, dope peddler, and it is said he can be hired as a killer. Have you picked him up yet? Well, I have not tried to. Why not? Uh, why not? Monsieur, in the Kasbah, at the sight of a uniform, everyone vanishes, zzzt, like rabbits in their holes. The Kasbah, huh? Oh, another thing. The property agent who was struck on the head, André Jordin, he has disappeared from the hospital. Disappeared? How? His window was open, the room was upset. It was very odd. Yeah. Well, look, Inspector, uh, I think I'll get on back to the hotel and uh, get some sleep. Yes. As you wish. Yeah, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Oh, there is one more thing, uh, Monsieur Dallin. Huh? I think perhaps I should warn you of something in the event you should call again on the Comtesse. Warn me of what? Well, two days ago, I installed a dictaphone in her apartment. You what? I must admit I found your conversation this evening most entertaining. Inspector... You are a rat. Oh, please do not concern yourself in the least. I am the soul of discretion. Maybe. Monsieur, I am a Frenchman. Twice tonight, the Casbah had been mentioned. A strange, mysterious native quarter on the steep hill behind the city. Maria had said her maid lived there. And now Bobo, who'd given poison wine to the diamond courier. I had an angle, and I had some ideas. The picture was finally starting to make sense. But I needed some more answers. And the trail led into the casbah. Johnny Dollar. This is Abdul. Abdul? You don't know me. So? I have the little business. Well, I'm so happy for you. I hope it's doing well. <laughs> Not bad. Okay, you what? You don't know me, but you're looking for me. Now look, Joe, Abdul. Uh, it, it is a business to uh, get jobs for people, for servants. Oh, the employment agent. Ah. Have you got the address of that girl who worked for the Countess d'Atelier? Oh, sure. You're very lucky. She's very pretty. You've got the wrong idea, Abdul. I just want to talk to her. <laughs> sure. Where does she live? For $20, I will remember. I'll give you ten. No, she's worth more. Look, knock it off. I gotta find her and talk to her fast while I'm still alive. And while she is. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Algiers, North Africa, to the Home Office Transworld Fidelity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lorco Diamonds matter. $100,000 worth missing. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 9, $15 even. Gratuity, tip, gift, bonus. Ah, why kid about it? It was a bribe. To a man named Abdul for the address of a girl named Chata. An address up in the native quarter, the Casbah. But the idea wasn't romance, no matter what Abdul thought. Four hours earlier, in the Countess d'Atelier's apartment, somebody had turned on the gas and tried to kill one or both of us. It was nine to one that the somebody was Chata the servant. I wanted to ask her why. I'd put my coat on and was just on the point of leaving my hotel. I slipped a gun into my side pocket and moved over to the door. Now, who is it? 
Holly Barrett. The guy you beat the daylights out of a couple hours ago, you know what I mean? No hard feelings, Dal. I just want to talk it over. All right, Barrett. What's on your mind? You object if I come inside? It's kind of personal, you know what I mean? Probably. All right, come on in. Much obliged. Hey, I didn't know who you were, but when we when we got in that little fracas, that their cop told me about it afterward. Man, you really got a wallop on you. You make a fella know he's had it, you know what I mean? Is that why you're here, a post-mortem on the fight? No, 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 it's done and over. You whip me, fair and square, as far as I'm concerned. Hey, Barrett, if you've got anything to say, let's have it fast. I'm in a hurry to get out of here. Oh, well, I sure don't want to take up no more of your time than necessary. I know how it is. Of course, I'm on vacation now, but back in Chicago, I'm in a meat business. Look, Barrett, will you please... Uh, At least in a way I am. I'm in uh, byproducts, actually. You know what they say? Use everything but the squeal. I'm the fellow that cans a squeal, you get it? Oh, brother. What I come here for was maybe to get it straightened out about that dame. Do you mean the Countess D'Atelier? Countess, Countess, them titles are a dime a dozen. I can buy them, sell them like sausages. Well, what about her? Now, look, neighbor, I was figuring to come here and put it to you man to man. You know what I mean? I know what I'm beginning to think you mean. I figure when you've seen my position, you'd want to do the square thing. Like anybody on the right side of the fence would. You with me, neighbor? You better drop that neighbor business. I've moved. Well, Dollar, the thing stacks up like this. Now, I already had my claim staked there before you even got in town. I got a lot of money invested in that dame. Barrett, so help me. I've been taking her around places, you know, feeding her, buying her, one thing and another. Why, I was even going to kick through... For a 20 grand chunk of ice for her. Well, she and I had that fight last week. You what? That dame's got highfalutin what ideas. What fight? What are you talking about? Well, I just put it to her. Cold turkey. I told her she had to quit Jenny flipping around with all those other fellas. Or I just wasn't going to have nothing more to do with her. Well, that made her mad, you understand? She lit into me. Man, you ought to hear that dame talk when she's mad. You'd, you'd think hey, that look, she... Hey, look, when was this fight? Was it before the diamonds were sent here? We well, sure. Sure, I said if that's the way she was going to act, she could forget about them diamonds. Well, I ain't seen her since or talked to her, but I just can't... I just can't seem to get her off my mind. Now, look, Dolly, you was in her apartment there for two hours and 40 minutes tonight, and I don't like it. It bothers me. Strictly business, Barrett. And I gotta get going. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Dolly. Wait a minute. We we still got something to settle here. Like I told you, I I got... Oh, Barrett, get out. Hey, you better hold your horses. I don't know if you know the, the name, C.K. Barrett, if that means anything to you. But I got influence back there in the United States. So it's the hard way, huh? Look, you just work for that company of yours. You're nothing but an employee. And if you think you can talk to me like you can to some of these foreigners, then... Here, now! Still a sucker for a left. Hello, room service. This is Johnny Dollar. Some drunk just wandered in here and passed out. Would you send up a couple of boys to drag it out in the hall? Expense account item 10, $5.30. A tip to the bellboys and taxi fare to the Casbah. The taxi dropped me off at the end of the causeway, and from there on I walked. It was late. Well after midnight. But the narrow, crooked alleys were teeming with life. Some of it out in the open, some of it undercover. Small groups of people met together here and there along the cobbled streets. Men of two dozen tongues and dialects. And women, too, slipped silently in and out of the dark doorways. Or crouched over tables in the dim-lit cafes and coffee houses. Groups usually fell silent when I passed and stared with hostile curiosity. The Casbah, backwash of North Africa. Little known, seldom bothered, and... Scarcely policed. And for an outsider, especially at night, more dangerous than dynamite. The address Abdul had given me turned out to be a coffee house, but it could still be legitimate. And there was only one way to find out. What do you want? I want to see Chata. What for? Private reasons. Chata's not here. Where can I find him? Take a seat, table in the corner. Maybe she come. I took the seat, ordered coffee, and waited. A wrinkled old Arab squatted on a rug in the middle of the room and played strange, weird melodies. Gradually, the other patrons went back to their conversations, ignoring me completely. In fact, pointedly. Twenty minutes passed. 
The girl didn't show. You will, of course, not object, monsieur, if I take the liberty of joining you? No, sit down. Merci. So, you wish to see Chat? Yeah, that's right. Do you know her? Oui. I know her very well. Now, where to find her? But naturally, monsieur. I always know where to find her. She's my woman. Ah, oh, so you're the man they call Bobo. Oui, monsieur. The man who poisoned the diamond courier. Oh, monsieur. It is true that I gave him some wine. A little, not much. But I think perhaps it was a bad vintage. Yes, most unfortunate. It was for him. Well, perhaps it was for the best. Life is so uncertain. But I do not wish to think of such unpleasantness. Instead, uh, let us talk about diamonds. Let's talk about killing, or attempted killing. Is Chanda the one who turned on the gas in the Countess's apartment? It is possible that she did that. On whose orders? It was nothing personal, monsieur. I didn't even know that you were going to be there. I see. Then you really meant to... Diamonds, monsieur. That's enough of this foolish talk of killing. All right. All right, what about the diamonds? You were sent here by the company that has insured them. Is that not correct? Yeah, that's right. And this company would like very much to recover these diamonds? That's why I'm here. C'est bien. Now, I'm told that these companies sometimes give large rewards, agree to an arrangement of a sort. Make a deal, you mean, with no questions asked. Yes, exactly. Now, is this thing true, monsieur? Is it possible that you would... Do you have the diamonds, Bobo? Well, let us say that I'm able to direct you to their location. You could almost call that a confession. Hmm. What does it matter, so long as we are in the Casper? Oh, yeah, sure. I imagine you have been spotted all over the place. At least 30, right in this room. I am in no danger here, monsieur. Tell me something. You didn't pull off this job by yourself. Who else was in on it? I only wish to talk about the diamonds. Well, can we come to an arrangement? Bobo, I don't make deals with murderers. It is better that you do not use such words, monsieur. It's true, though, isn't it? That is not the question. It is only that I resent the insulting way Bobo! in which you... Bobo, the gendarme! What? Why are you coming here? Bobo! Oui, oui, oui. Did you arrange for the police to come here, monsieur? I'm as surprised as you are, Bobo. Ah, consider this matter of the deal. We will talk more at some other time, eh? The patrons rushed for the doors, and in one minute flat, the coffee house was empty. Even the owner was gone. I was the only one left. Three minutes later, the inspector with a flying squad of 20 men came bursting in from the street. Well, Monsieur Deller, I'm happy to find you are still alive. Why don't you get lost somewhere? For you, I think it most fortunate that we arrive in time. Oh, sure, in time to follow up the only lead I had in this case. To lose a suspect is better than to lose one's life, Monsieur. Look, Inspector, I was holding a gun in my pocket, covering Bobo from the second he sat down at the table. But, Monsieur, so I... 30 men or not, if it had come to a showdown, he couldn't have done a thing. Because he'd have been the first one to get it, and he's smart enough to have known that. But I thought Let's that... face it, Inspector, you've done it again. You goofed. But I was only thinking that perhaps... Mon Dieu, what is to happen next? The shooting was somewhere outside, but it hadn't been the police. All of the inspector's men were inside the coffee house. He gave them orders quickly, and they fanned out to search the area. The streets were empty now, dark and silent, not a soul in sight. We split up into pairs. I worked with Inspector Marcus for a while and left him and searched alone along a narrow side passage. And that's where I found him. He'd been shot three times in the back, and he was dying. Monsieur Dollar. Yeah, Bobo. You you can't forget that deal, I think. Yeah. It's a little too late for deals now. Who was in on it with you, Bobo? Look, you've got nothing to lose by talking. You know that, don't you? Except my honor, monsieur. As a citizen of the Casper. Who shot you? A dragon, monsieur. Twelve feet tall. With fiery eyes. All right, Bobo, all right. But just tell me this. Just one thing. Are you the man who attacked the property agent at the airport? The man who slugged André Jourdain? Oui, monsieur. I do it very good. No. Almost I kill him. It's too bad. I... I... A minute or two later, Inspector Marcus came up and we stood there looking down at the dead man lying on the stones of the alley. He was a short man, stockily built with wide shoulders and a deep chest. It was the body of a man of action, of accomplishment. 
But he'd chosen to be a smuggler, dope peddler, thief, and killer. And now he had become the victim of another killer. Did he say anything, monsieur? Was he able to talk? Yeah, enough. Eh? What is it you mean, monsieur? Do you know who is guilty of this? Yeah, that's right, Inspector. I know the whole story now. The whole filthy, rotten story. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Maria. Maria? Well, isn't it kind of late at night to call? You've got to help me, Johnny. I'm being followed. You're being... Aren't you at home? No, it's a little cafe on the waterfront. I came in here to phone... Why the devil did you have to go out? Everything was set up. If you'd stayed home, you'd have been safe. What are you trying to do, get yourself killed? Johnny, this is no time... Where are you? What's the name of the place? The, the Marrakesh, number 41, Rue de la Mer. I'm afraid to go outside. No, whatever you do, don't go outside. Stay right where you are until I get there. But Johnny... Take I'm... your choice, Maria. It's either that or wind up on a marble slab. What do you mean? You know what I mean. You know better than anybody. Now stay there. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Algiers, North Africa, to the Home Office Transworld Fidelity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lorco Diamonds Matter. $100,000 in jewels stolen and a murder. Expense account continued. (laughs) Item 12, $2.20. Taxi fare to the waterfront of the Marrakesh Cafe. There was no time to lose and no time to get help from Inspector Marcus. A half hour earlier, he'd set a trap, and he and his men were staked out around Maria's apartment house waiting. But apparently, she'd gone to the cafe before he got there. So now the whole thing had blown wide open. Rue de la Mer was a dead-end street close to the water, deserted at this hour of night. A couple of dim street lights and a light over the door of the Marrakesh Cafe. Everything else was in darkness. There was no movement, no sign of life. Over here, Johnny. Oh, thank heaven you got here. Yeah. No trouble so far, huh? No. Except with that sailor over there. He finally passed out. Well, you're probably I... used to that kind of trouble. Cigarette? Yes, thank you. Now, what were you doing down here at this time of night? I, uh, was visiting a friend. Is that the friend's car parked out at the curb? Yes. Charlie Barrett, huh? The meat packer from Chicago who was going to give you the Lorco diamonds. Well, I figured he'd get over his man spell. How did you know about it? He told me just before I knocked him out for the second time tonight. He said you two had a fight over a week ago. And that he told you he wasn't buying any diamonds after all. Well, it was just... For a while, I thought I had you tagged again. I wondered why you hadn't canceled the order when you'd been told he wasn't going to pay for the stuff. Johnny, it was just a talk. I knew he would come around. Yeah, well, that's about the way I figured it. Another explanation. So I let you off the hook again. Why, Johnny? Why have you been trying so hard? Trying what? To find some way of involving me in this. Well, the facts just seemed to turn up. I wasn't trying to find them. It made a big difference, didn't it? Learning about Mr. Barrett. Learning what about him? That I was accepting a $20,000 gift from him. Why should it? Your life's your own. It did, though. Before that, you were... Well, you seemed to be interested. Sure. You're a very beautiful woman. And that's all it was? What more did you want? All right, Johnny. Forget it. I don't blame you. Hey, tell me something. What about Barrett? Now that you've kissed and made up, is the engagement back on again? I haven't decided yet, Johnny. Ah. Well, come on. Let's get out of here. I'll take you home. Do you think it's safe? There was no sign of anybody around when I came in. Whoever it was probably got scared off. Oh, I was scared to death. When I saw the lights of the cafe, I jammed on the brakes and ran for the door. There, the car was right behind me. Get a look at the driver? No. How'd you get hold of Barrett's car? Borrow it? He gave it to me. Hmm. Not a bad night's work. It's a good car. Get in. You really play rough, don't you, Johnny? Sometimes. It depends on... Get down. Quick. Back of the car. 
It came from across the street. It's pitch black over there. What are you going to do? Look, Maria, you're safe as long as you're back at the car here. Well, what about you? I can't get a shot from here. I'm pinned down. I'm going to make a run for that stone curb. Try to draw a shot and see where the flash comes from. Be careful, Johnny. Oh, don't worry, kid. I'm the carefulest guy you ever saw. All right, now sit tight. Here goes. Are you all right, Johnny? Yeah, I think I got him spotted. Let's see just how close I get. Can... Is somebody running away? Yeah, so do I. Oh, where the devil? Why don't they get some streetlights down there? That car that's starting up. Yeah, I see it. They're getting away. One lucky shot, my... Ah. Give me your keys. Wait here, I'm going after no, them. No, no, I'm going with you. Then pile in. Hurry up, let's go. A few blocks away, I picked up the taillights of the other car and poured on the gas to keep hanging on. We roared through the empty streets along the waterfront, then swung into the coast road and headed out of the city. The model I was driving had been built for road racing, and barring accidents, I didn't figure the car ahead had much chance of shaking me. It was a narrow, winding road following the rocky edge of the headlands, and the curves were sharp and dangerous, especially at the speed we were traveling. Finally, it happened. The car ahead roared up a steep grade and missed the curve at the top, it rolled over and over, the headlights cutting crazy patterns in the blackness as it plunged down towards the beach. I finally braked to a stop about 30 yards from the wreck, jumped out and started toward it, and just then... The gas tank caught and burst, and the car exploded into a tower of flames. I caught a glimpse of the driver pinned in the wreck. Then the fire took over and covered him, and I knew one thing was certain. He'd had it. It's dying down. Yeah. The gasoline is all burned down. Oh, what a terrible way to die. What way isn't? I guess... Johnny, could I have a cigarette, please? Yeah, sure. Here you go. Thank you. Yeah, light up, Maria, while you watch him burn. What a horrible thing to say. It's quite a relief, though, isn't it, knowing you're safe now? Well, of course it's a relief when someone has just tried to kill you and now you know that they... That's true, but it's not what I meant. I don't think I understand you. What I meant was you're safe because now he won't be able to talk. Able to... Who won't be able? Do you mean you know who's in that car? Of course, and so do you. It's the customs property agent, Andre Jourdain. Andre? Sure. Who else would have any reason to kill you since he was the only one left after... Oh, I guess you haven't heard about it yet. Bobo's dead, too. What? Who is Bobo? Your other partner. Andre shot him in the back earlier tonight, up in the Casbah. So you're doubly safe now, Maria. They're both dead. And for everything else, you've got an explanation. With just one exception. I don't even know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, now, don't be modest. Actually, it was quite a scheme, whether you thought it up or Andre oh, did. Oh, you are out of your mind. The idea was to make sure the diamond courier died, either on the plane or at least before he got through customs. That way, the courier's briefcase would be sent to Andre's office. Then Bobo was to help Andre fake the stick-up. But Bobo turned out to be a tough cookie. This may be true, Instead but Instead of I... sticking to plan, he decided to go for broke. When he slugged Andre, he tried to make it stick, but Andre managed to reach his gun, so he ended up in the hospital instead of the morgue. What has all this got to do with me? Then Andre got the idea of a double cross. He left the hospital, went into the cosmet to look for Bobo. He found him. And he killed him. I still don't see His what... next step was a natural, to knock you off and keep the whole take for himself. We expected it, and we were ready for him. Inspector Marcus is staked out right now at your apartment house, waiting for Andre to show up. We didn't know you'd already gone out earlier. Well, all of this may be true, Johnny. But why do you insist on trying to fit me into the picture? Because that's where you belong. I mentioned the fact that you'd been able to come up with an explanation every time you needed it. With just one exception. What exception? Both Andre and Bobo have tried to kill you this evening. Why? Unless you were in on this thing, what reason would they have? Well, I... I don't know. I... Of course. Why should I know? I don't know why they tried to kill me, Johnny. Oh, a good answer, Maria. And it'll probably work. Yeah, you figured that one out fast. I don't know what you no, mean. No, caution. Well... Who has the diamonds? I will, before morning. Johnny, why couldn't you... Knock have... it off, kid. You got the wrong guy. It won't work with me. It could. You... Sure, I know. You're beautiful, charming, lovely. And you're rotten. Rotten right to the core. 
What are you doing, Johnny? Going back to town. Well, wait for me. Goodbye, Maria. Johnny, wait. Johnny! An hour later, I was out at the air terminal in the customs property office watching Inspector Marcus open a vault. Mon Dieu, what a nuisance. Always they make these combinations so difficult. That's the general idea, Inspector. Uh, true, but still one would think... That... Ah, 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 there we are. And now, if you are correct, Monsieur Dallaire, we shall soon have our hands... There, and... that briefcase in the corner. Uh, ah, may we? Oui. It is the one. Good. Let's have a look at it. It will be necessary to force the lock. Here, pry it open with this. Looks like an easy one. It is merely a matter of... Voila. Ooh, beautiful, no? Yeah, too beautiful. Mm. Tell me something, Monsieur Dollar. What made you know that André Jordine was guilty? Something Bobo said just before he died. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He confessed he was the man who had slugged André. But Andre had described his assailant as tall and thin. Bobo was short with a stocky build. Andre had lied. Mm. And all this time, the diamonds were right here in this vault to which Andre, as property agent, had access. Can you think of a safer place? Hey, Inspector, what about Maria Datoria? Mm. Well, I, I, I am inclined to agree with you, Monsieur Dollar, but... Uh, uh, well... Yeah, I know. Nothing but suspicion. Yeah, yeah, precisely. If I were to file charges and bring her to trial on such evidence as this, well, she would cry a little, perhaps, and look very beautiful. And, monsieur, the court would hang me, not her. Yeah, you're right. You could never make it stick. Yeah. C'est la vie. <laughs> Expense account item 13, $624.80. Hotel, meals, and incidentals in Algiers and transportation back to the States. Expense account total, $1,214.60. End of expense account. End of report. Remarks? Social item. To be circulated widely. The Countess Maria Datolia was married yesterday to C.K. Barrett, a big tycoon in the meat business. The happy couple will make their home in Chicago. All companies in that area who may be asked to underwrite insurance on the life of C.K. Barrett, don't. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be a new exciting story on Johnny Dollar beginning next Monday. Next week, the Broderick matter, an exciting chase after a charming, beautiful girl. After all, who wouldn't? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Bayef, Jack Moyles, Victor Perrin, C.K. Barrett, Lawrence Dobkin, Forrest Lewis, and Jay Novello. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> 